me and Mark one today. We're continuing our verse by verse study of Mark's gospel. So we're in Mark 1, 21 through 28. And the title of this morning's message is The Beginning of the Conquest of Jesus. The Beginning of the Conquest of Jesus. So let's read our text here in Mark 1, beginning of verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed that they questioned among themselves, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Would you guys pray with me? Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that it blesses the church today, both the reading and the proclamation of it. I pray that Christ is lifted up that I would step out of the way and I would just exalt your Son as the Spirit shines the light upon Him. Please strengthen your church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now last week we had studied the call of the first four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. These were the four fishermen from the region of Galilee. They were called by Christ, remember, to be fishers of men. And we discussed to be fishers of men means to rescue people from the judgment to come, to snatch them from the fires. We also talked about last week that the calling of these men, this was now an illustration of what it actually means to repent and to believe in the gospel of God. Well, church, in our text today, Jesus comes again with full authority. His full authority, not in just calling his own chosen disciples, but now we see his authority in both his teaching and also his exercising of the demonic realm. And the connection I want you to make here in our passage is, I want you to see that Jesus is now beginning a conquest to now drive out his enemies from the land. And so this sermon, we're going to tackle three basic points. The first is Jesus' authority in his teaching. It'll be verses 21 and 22. The second section reveals Jesus' conquest in his exercising of the demons. He conquers the demons. That's 23 through 26. And then lastly, we see the response of all those who are in the synagogue and church. This is our application. How do we respond just as they did? So gaze with me again back at our text, verses 21 and 22. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the, entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. Now the location here, we're in Capernaum. As mentioned last week, this was Jesus' home base during his time of ministry in the region of Galilee. Capernaum, if we think about the geography of Israel... This is in the northern section of Galilee. You then have Judea, a southern section where Jerusalem was. And Capernaum was the city on the northern shore of the sea. And the, friends, the Sea of Galilee was, was massive. It was seven miles wide, nearly 13 miles across. And it's in this region where Jesus had just called his first four disciples to lay behind their lives, their occupation, and to pick up a life of discipleship. And so it's here in this region of Capernaum that Jesus goes immediately, which is one of Mark's favorite words, he immediately goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now just to lay out the Sabbath, this may be common knowledge for you, but it's interesting. The Sabbath was the high, holy Jewish day of rest. Friends, the Sabbath was established by God in the Garden of Eden at the very beginning, at creation. The Sabbath is then later confirmed in the book of Exodus. It, it was a constant reminder to the people of the seventh day of creation where God rested from His works. Now in our day and time, we call it the Lord's Day. 
And now we practice it when? On Sunday. The reason being the first Sabbath was established at creation. The Lord's Day is established at new creation. Who's the beginning of new creation? Jesus Christ and His resurrection. The Jews called it the eighth day. We call it our first day. It's the day of rest. And so the Lord's Day, both in the Old and in the New Testament, this was a, a day of reflection upon God's goodness. The Lord's Day has always been a day centered upon worship of God with His people corporate. Friends, you go to church. That's what you do. You don't stay out in your own home and you watch videos. I know that is so prevalent today. It's a gathering of people where we come together and worship the triune God. And so we see in our passage here, the people of God, they're now gathering together in the synagogue where the scriptures are being read and being taught. Now, understand, in first century Israel, there was just one temple. There was one temple. It was in Jerusalem. That's where sacrifices were made. But then there were these synagogues that were established anywhere there were 10 men in a region that were older than 13 years old, 13 years and older, they would establish these synagogues, these places where they would meet and study. And the synagogue system is traced all the way back to the Babylonian exile in 586 B.C. The reason being because when the Jews were exiled, they had no temple. The place of worship was gone. And so they set up the synagogue system. And until, not until much later when the temple was actually rebuilt, that was the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. At that point, then, temple worship was restored. But then well into the first century, where we hear with Jesus, the temple remained, but yet the synagogues, they, they never went away. They continued as these places of worship. And so the synagogues would be used for educational purposes and, and gatherings and for corporate worship. And now today, in the 21st century, friends, there's no temple for the Jews. Where do they worship today? In the synagogue. It still continues. They're longing for a future temple, but today they worship in the synagogue. Now, why am I laying out all this background information? The reason being is because our church model that we have in the New Testament for gathering for worship to hear the Bible being read and being taught has a synagogue feel to it. All right, there's elements of temple. There's, there's a sacrifice that happens on Sunday. Our bodies are a sacrifice. Our songs ascend to heaven in worship. The temple is the very place where God dwells. We now are the temple, Paul says. But also, our gatherings have a very strong influence of the, the synagogue model. We, we gather for prayer. We gather for the reading of the scripture. The Bible is taught to the people. We gather for socializing. All that to say, our understanding of church, friends, this was not invented. This was not invented in the first century. This has roots in the Old Testament. We stand with the people of God when we worship from the Old Testament. It just continues on into our day. And it's here now in the synagogue that Jesus is teaching. And by the way, friends, he's teaching with authority. Not as the scribes would do. But he's actually teaching and, and preaching here. There's gravitas. There's gravity and weight behind what Christ is saying. See, the scribes of Jesus' day, they were made up of the Pharisees and there were some Sadducees and priests within that. But the scribes, their job was to interpret the law. They interpreted the Torah for the people. And their interpretations relied very heavily upon tradition that were both oral and also written down. And so they would quote dead rabbis in order to interpret their passage. So in essence, what they're doing the, the scribes are teaching the interpretation of another man's interpretation. Friends, there's no weight to that. That's ridiculous. That's secondary information. That's pretty weak teaching. There's no gravity to it. And Jesus actually rebukes men for doing this. In Mark 7, he tells the people that you've relied on the traditions of men instead of the word of God. And if you do that, he says, you actually make void the word of God. It has now become obsolete to you. That's a pretty sharp rebuke for the words of Christ. Now, I'm sure some of us, we've seen or we've experienced some of this within different assemblies. Not, not necessarily people quoting ancient rabbis by any means, but people that are relying on anything but the word of God to get their point across. I mean, in our day and age, do we not actually still believe that God, through the faithful preaching of the word, can edify his people. 
Can't we keep people's attention through the preached word? I mean, some establishments, they're so heavily weighted today on traditions and rituals that the word of God being taught is about five minutes. Because what they want to do is have these rituals and they're shouting and they're standing and they're kneeling. That has now taken precedence within their worship services. We see that within mass, different mass services. Other folks today, they want to rely on heavily outside sources to support their teaching. Like, for example, people coming up and say, hey, I want to show you a 10 minute video clip. And it's some comedy from 1999. The reason being is because there's no gravity in the word in which they're about to preach. This is the reason why I'm not showing you video clips here. We're not, there's no fog machines. There's no strobe lights coming to you. We believe in the sufficiency of the word. That's where the gravity comes from. That's the weightiness of it. And so the scribes, where they erred, was interpreting man's interpretation. For example, they would say things like this. Rabbi Hillel said this. Friends, Jesus responded with, Oh, you've heard it said of old. I say unto you, he would quote the Old Testament, and then he would interpret it right before their eyes. Friends, that carries weight. That's where the authority comes from. I mean, imagine that the word of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, actually speaks with authority when he speaks the written word. It only makes sense. When Jesus Christ bears the sword of the Spirit to the people, when the Word of God comes forth, He's cutting people. People are being changed. They're being transformed. They're being edified. They're being convicted. And friends, this is the model for us. Real authority comes from the Word of God. Not just from the pulpit in preaching and in teaching, but friends, in discipleship, in your homes, with your spouses, when you're correcting people out in society, we bring the word of God to people. We don't back down with that. We're not to be people that, are, that live by man-made traditions and, and interpretations and schemes. I'm telling you, in order for us, with the decay of society going on today, in order for us to be effective in the long run as individuals and as the church, we have to be centered on God's word and do not apologize for it. That is the sole rule and authority for all practice for us. Because, friends, being Scripture-driven is a mark of a true Christian. And that's the mark of a faithful church. So secondly, in our text, we see there that Jesus' authority in his teaching. Now I want you to see his authority over the demonic realm. Look with me again at verses 23 through 26. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. So Jesus here now encounters this man who has an unclean spirit. Or as we would call him, it's a, it's a demon. This is a demon. I want to pause for just a minute. This is just a little sidebar that we'll get back into the text here. I want you to ask yourself this question. What is a demon? Have you ever even thought about this? I mean, I'm going to give you three different interpretations of what a demon is, and I want to give you the correct one and refute the other two. Here's the three views. Number one, it's a fallen angel. Demons are fallen angels. That's one view. The second view is demons are the spirits of evil men. The third view is that demons are the spirit, spiritual products of angels cohabitating with women. That's from Genesis 6. Now, friends, I want to give you the, what the Jews believed. This might blow you, blow you away here. The Jews believed that demons were recognized as the spiritual beings of angels cohabitating with women. And when their offspring would die, then the demon would roam the earth. Why? Because it's not fully angel, it's not fully man. There's no place to go. Therefore, it roams the earth. That was the first century Jewish thought. I know that's crazy, but you can read history upon that with the church fathers. They all held to that view. The reason why demons can't be fallen angels, and Anik and I were talking about this earlier this week, what do you think demons are? And automatic response is, they're, they're angels. They're bad angels that have fallen down. They can't be angels because angels everywhere in the Bible have bodies. And this demon has now come and inhabited a body. It can't be an angel. It's not a fallen angel. And then thirdly, it cannot be the spirits of evil men. 
Because, friend, when people die, they either go immediately, their spirit, their body goes down, their spirit immediately goes to either be with the Lord or away from the Lord. And so it can't be that either. Now, friends, I'm guessing you've probably never really thought about demons before in this way. It's very quite interesting when you study church history. So I wanted to give you that little sidebar, and I will hop back into our text here. And just understand this, this demon here recognizes Christ. He calls him the Holy One of God, and he calls him Jesus of Nazareth. This demon knows more about Jesus than most people in America do today. He recognizes his humanity and his deity. I mean, listen to the confession he makes. He says, you're the Holy One of God, and you're coming to destroy us. I mean, I'm telling you, the average man on the street today, who, and even people who profess the faith at times, do not have as great of a testimony as the demon does. He knows who Jesus is, and he knows there is a judgment to come. Most people reject that there's a judgment, and they fail to know who Christ is. The point here being, this just goes to show you that knowledge of Jesus and God does not save you. Knowledge doesn't save you. Repentance and faith in Christ is what saves you. The Apostle James says in James 2.19, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Mental assent to basic truths from the Scripture, that's not what makes you right with God. You can even say, yes, I believe Jesus died. Yes, I believe Jesus was raised. You can ascend to those truths, but that is not what saves you. It's repentance and faith. I mean, we see this, don't we? There's a mass apostasy that's happening in our generation. People that have grown up in the church. I mean, statistics show that 85% of children, by the time they go to college, they will lose their faith. 85%. People that have been indoctrinated with truth their entire life, they've heard it. They can ascend to those truths, but they will fall away. Now, let me give you a, a really a good modern day example of this. His name, a man named Joshua Harris. Have you heard of the name Joshua Harris? Well, he wrote this book. It was called Kissing, Dating, Goodbye. He's one of the leaders of the purity movement from the 1990s. Uh, pastored churches, all, all sorts of stuff. Well, friends, he fell away from the faith about a month ago. He's fallen away from the faith. This man has authored books. He's pastored churches. He can recite way more verses than I can. I can guarantee that. But friends, he's an apostate. He is away from the faith. He is unsaved. That is a tragedy. And it goes to show us that mental truth doesn't save you. You must be born again. Your heart has to be transformed by the Spirit of God. Because unless the truth that's been hammered in your head moves to your heart, and by God's grace, He miraculously causes you to be made a new creation in Christ, you are not converted. Now I say this because I fear that there are some here, even within our midst, that have only acknowledged the truth claims of Christ, but you're not born again. Friends, you must be born again. Let me tell you something really funny here. George Whitfield one time was preaching open air. And Whitfield, he could preach in the 18th century, he could preach so loud to 30,000 people with no amplification. Incredible. Greatest open air preacher of all time. A woman came up to him one time and said, Whitfield, why do you keep saying you must be born again? He turned to her and said, Ma'am, because you must be born again. That is just the truth. It's not about what you know. It's about regeneration. It's about being made a new creation in Christ. So church, do not be surprised that demons know more than you and I do. And yet they will spend an eternity in the lake of fire. Secondly, not only do demons know... They shudder in fear, James 2 tells us. And that doesn't save them either. Yes, we should acknowledge Proverbs 1 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We ought to fear God. He's the one who will cast both body and soul into hell. But that fear should be a fear that is healthy and it actually drives us not to fear-filled conversion, but tear-filled conversion. Where you're broken over your sin that you've offended a holy God. And now you're on your knees asking the Lord for forgiveness. We want to be converted through tears, not through fear. And so friends, demons don't lack knowledge. They don't lack fear. They're terrified that Christ has now come. They know who He is. 
They just lack submission to Christ's lordship. So let me remind you in Philippians 2 that their lack of submission, their denial of his lordship, that won't last forever. That won't last forever for anybody because one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this demon here is about to find out the hard way. Jesus is not messing around. Look at verse 25 again. I want you to notice here Jesus' halting response. He rebukes the demon. He says to him, be silent. Come out of him. And here with the authoritative words of the living God, through Jesus Christ, the one who spoke creation into existence, cast the demon out of the man. All it takes is the spoken word. Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light, and there was light immediately. Jesus says, be gone, be silent, and he's silent. This poor, wretched man who was plagued by the demon has now been rescued. He's been restored. This is a visual picture of what happens when light penetrates the darkness. Now it's here that I want to tell you why I named the, the sermon, titled the sermon, The Beginning of the Conquest of Jesus. Because I want you to see here, now is where we see the kingdom of God beginning to now drive out the kingdoms of Satan. Now, one of my great joys and delights as a pastor that I want for you is for you to be fascinated with the scriptures. And that's why on the sermons I want to show you not just the New Testament, but how the Old Testament is now pointed towards it the whole time. And so now I want to make one of those connections for you today. And it's this. Jesus in our passage is coming now as the greater Joshua to now come and drive out his enemies from the land. Now let me explain. We read Joshua 1 at the beginning. That was purposeful. Because in the book of Joshua, he's given a commission by God. Moses has now died. They've wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. They're now overlooking the promised land. God now commissions Joshua. Go in. You're to go into the land of promise, the land of Canaan, filled with milk and honey. But it's also filled with your enemies. And we get a very vivid picture of the enemies of God in the Old Testament that Joshua was to fight. In Numbers 13, these were people that devoured others. They were cannibals. They ate other people. These were the enemies. They were strong. The scripture says they were also giants. There were giants in the land. I mean, it's crazy stuff. And Joshua was told to then go in and take the people into the land, and he's to wipe out all the enemies. Because the promised people of God were to occupy this land. Now, if you recall this morning, we read in Joshua 1, God gave the promise to Joshua. It says this, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I have given to you. Now, some people put that on a t-shirt, right? This is a, a surefire promise.